Okay. Okay, guys, how you doing? Defend Mashiach. All right. Sorry for the lighting. Okay. Hopefully it's good. Yeah, Adam Mashiach. In Jesus' name. Okay. Hopefully the lighting is good. Okay, guys. Sorry. This is the best I can do. Hope you guys are doing all right. I know this is an impromptu session. Najim, how are you? Jason, welcome. Zarina, how are you, everyone? Impromptu session. I know it's the last minute. The reason why I decided to do it now is because I have some free time. Sal el no. How are you, brother? I have some free time, and Lord willing, I won't be able to go live tomorrow, I don't think, because I head back to my destination and I fly out on Tuesday, God willing. And so I missed you guys, and I decided let me do a live stream by the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, hoping Jesus Christ, my Lord, my God, my Savior, will use me for He doesn't need me and have mercy on me. Father's spirit. Okay. I hope. Hold on. I hope the internet stays up now. Okay, we're gonna try. Sit lock. Sorry, guys. This is the best I can do. Hopefully, the internet connection will be okay. How are you, Sister Romina? All right. Sorry about that, man. It's bad. Let's see. Hmm. Hold on a second. Let me see. Let me check something. I'm on uh, Link Internet. I don't know if this is the right one. Let me check. Let me find out. Hold on. I may have to start again. Hold on, guys. We, I'm sorry about that. I may have to go on a different link. Is the is the screen bad or is it okay? It's blurry. Is it okay on the uh, for you guys? I'm trying my best because this is the best that I can get. It looks a little blurry for me. How about you guys? Blurry, huh? All right. Let's see. Sorry, I may have to shut down. Okay, let's try this. I may have to shut down and do it again. Don't worry, I'll come back. La 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 This best I can do. What's up, Susan? How are you? How are you, sister? I hope you got your answers. Yeah, guys, this is the best I can do, to be honest with you. Malfona, why don't you make it way? I don't know what Malfona means, and I don't know what Epic means. Epic, brother. Epic. Let's see if I can get better. Yes, Fadi. Michael Brown answering Jewish objections to Jesus. Answering Jew Jewish objections to Jesus. Five volumes. Michael Brown has debated. Let me go here. Michael Brown has debated Tobia Singer, and he is Tobia Singer's worst nightmare. Folks, we're going to do the, as best as we can. Oops, that sun is really bad. Wow, this is like very bad. I lack very nice. Yeah, the connection is bad. Let's see. Yeah. No, against Basam Zawadi. Zawadi. Okay. No, not in April. Yeah, April of next year, if he sets it up, yes. And I promise you, I'm going to do to James White what I've done to no debate opponent. And I'm going to humble him by the grace of Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, it's blurry as it is because the connection is not too good. So if it's bothering you guys, I'll just shut down. You want me to shut down? Or do you want me to keep going? Is it okay? Okay. Sorry, this is going to be as good as it gets, folks. It's because I'm in a new location. I'm in a new location. I don't want to give away the location. I'm actually at my oldest brother's house. And so his internet is okay. It's not like, you know, top notch, but that's okay. I'm just waiting for my friend Protestant to show up because we're going to continue discussing. Yeah, it's very bad. Sorry. We're going to continue discussing. Right. Oh, he's here. Okay, it's our brother. Uh, the extent of the atonement that I started last week because we went on not a tangent. 
wasn't a tangent. It still was relevant because it answered questions that people had about animals. Are they soulish? Do they have souls? Do they have spirits? What's up, jo Joshua Sliwa? That's an Assyrian name, isn't it? Sliwa, right? No, it's good now. All right. In Jesus' name. I'll pray for the internet connection, the connectivity to stay like this. I've got this right here on my leg. What did you think of the session? I got this on my leg. So that's why my chest is sticking out and look puffy. All right. Okay. But anyway, good. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise God. Praise be the God and Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Father, we love you. We don't love you the way we should love you. And we don't love you as much. And forgive us, Father. Forgive us. In Jesus' name, have mercy on us, Father. We love your son, the Lord Jesus. And for the sake of your son, forgive us and wash us in the blood of Jesus. And we're in love with the Holy Spirit because we need your Holy Spirit. Without your Holy Spirit, we cannot do this. So sanctify us by your Holy Spirit and fill us with your Holy Spirit. And Father, please give us the power of your Holy Spirit to be patient with one another, compassionate towards one another and to love each other for the sake of Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. And Father, please have mercy on me. Crucify our flesh, destroy our flesh and the fruit of the flesh and give us the power of your spirit to be filled with fruit of your spirit, life from your spirit, Holy Spirit, Father, life from your Holy Spirit, life from your Holy Spirit in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. And Father, anoint this session. Grant me clarity of thought and speech. Save me from error, misinterpretation. Save me from unrighteous anger, Father. Anoint my words to speak truly, clearly, accurately for the glory of Jesus by the might and power of your spirit. And bless everyone here, Father, with wisdom, knowledge, understanding from your Holy Spirit. And give us a teachable attitude, a humble heart, Father. We love you. We love the Lord Jesus. We love your Holy Spirit. And save us from attacks of the enemy, Father. Cover us with the blood of Jesus and wash us in the blood of Jesus and our loved ones. Wash our loved ones, my daughters, in the blood of Jesus, Father. And have your way. Anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to the ears of your servants. And just fill me with the breath of life, my lungs, my throat, my chest, with the health I need to glorify you. We ask this in Jesus' name, Father, Son, Spirit, in Jesus' name. Yehovah, Father, Son, Spirit. All right. Picture is good now. So hopefully I won't have to charge it. If I do, I'm going to have to move, move it around. But good to see you guys. I know this is impromptu. It was last second. I wasn't planning to. But I decided, you know what, I'm going to do a session because I'm going to drive back tomorrow. I'm going to be driving back tomorrow, and I will, probably won't have time. Probably won't have time to do a live stream. And so I head back tomorrow, and then Tuesday, God willing, Lord Jesus willing, I fly back to Chicago. Pray for me. I have a big date, September 26. Ask the Lord Jesus Christ in his infinite love mercy to show up. Grant me favor because September 26, I can be free. And then if I'm free, I leave. I leave and I relocate to a new state by the grace of Jesus Christ. And hopefully when I get to that new state, if he permits, I'm going to be doing local Bible studies like I used to in Chi-Town. So pray for me, guys, and pray for my daughters that God will provide for them overabundantly and seal them by the Spirit and drown them in his infinite love and provide through me for them. Keep us together for the glory of Jesus Christ. Thank our brother Protestant believer. He comes here as a service. He doesn't get paid to do this. And he posts Bible verses for me, making my job easier. So pray for him. The Lord Jesus bless him and his family and provide for him. And happy belated birthday to Protestant believer. Right? He's a good brother in the Lord. Loves Jesus Christ. And by the grace of God, the Lord has given grace to put up with my imperfections. If you can put up with my imperfections, I pray that I can be a blessing. We're going to continue discussing the extent of the atonement because some people, yep, I need prayer because it's so corrupt in Chicago. The legal system, the court system, the judges, it is as corrupt as California. That's why I'm not relocating to California. But thank the Lord Jesus Christ for his love and mercy. Medic, tell me something I don't know. That only confirms what I've said about James White. He uses the DL show as a bully pulpit to try to intimidate people, attack people, talk down to people, but we ain't buying it. He doesn't scare anyone. And he uses it to dole meat to his fan base, right? But people have gotten tired of him, right? And it's not just me. 
people from his own camp, Reformed Baptists, they're just disgusted with him. But God have mercy on him. God have mercy on me because I'm afraid I'm becoming no better than him. But in Jesus' name, may he have mercy on him and me and save us. Please, Lord Jesus, please. Sa'al Noam, I think we'll reconcile when he learns to be humble and stop attacking Christians in a nasty, arrogant manner, right? right? Anyway, God have mercy on him. He's a brother still, right? And I pray that him and I are able to crucify our flesh by the power of the Holy Spirit because if we keep this up, we're going to be less how do i say this we're going to be more of an obstacle than a blessing to the kingdom may god save us from that in jesus name all right thank you all right we're going to continue discussing the extent of the atonement pray that the debates go through and i don't say this in arrogance may the lord jesus crucify my flesh and destroy my flesh I promise you, if the debates go through, I will do to him what no Christian has done to him before. He will be humbled and exposed by the grace of Jesus Christ. That's my promise to you. That's my promise by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. No, it's not that I'm so much tired, even though I am Abraham. It's because I'm here at my brother's place, and I don't want to be too loud. I don't want to disrespect him. It's his home, so I have to be respectful and honorable. Yep, Trent Horn did humble him. Trent Horn handed in him a spanking. Because in his arrogance, he thought he was going to just steamroll Trent Horn. And he is. He does pander to Muslims. But God have mercy on him, right? Okay, now that's it. Let's not talk about that. I don't want to turn my sessions into a bully pulpit like James White does. Let the Lord deal with him. And God have mercy on him, and God have mercy on all of, all of us, right? Let's just focus on this. So, guys, when I start a live stream, don't mention him. There's no need to mention him or anyone else. We don't want to make our live streams about personalities and attack them because that's what James White does. I'm going to just say this as a final word. James White DL has become disgusting to listen to because now he spends most of his time attacking people, <clears throat> trying to scare people with bully tactics and just being nasty, and it's becoming sickening to listen to him. I don't want my channel to follow his example. May Jesus save us from that, right? I will humble him by the power of the triune God in Jesus' name when it comes debate time. That's what I'm going to do my talking when I expose him and his man-made uh, teaching in Jesus' name. Let's just now focus on glorifying Jesus Christ. Are you guys ready? You guys ready? So pray God save me from myself, save me from becoming like white, save me from my own flesh, right? I don't follow that path. God forbid in Jesus' name may have mercy. Okay, let's begin. We're going to talk about the extent of the atonement. I'm going to pick up where we left off because a lot of people were shocked by the teaching. A lot of people were asking the Lord, praying that God would give them the answer about whether animals have souls. Are they soulish? Do they have spirits? Yes, they do. Do not let any man of God tell you otherwise. Do not. The scriptures are clear. Animals, the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, are living souls. I proved that from the original languages. They are soulish creatures like human beings, and they have spirits. So don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Now, with that said, let me repeat. Does that mean that when they die, their souls slash spirits continue to exist consciously, and will they be raised? Here's the honest answer. You guys ready for the honest answer? An on answer that's biblical? Do you guys want the answer to that question? Will they be resurrected? Do they continue to live as disembodied souls slash spirits? You guys ready for the answer? Okay. How many are you ready? I don't know. And nobody knows. You know why nobody knows? Because the Bible is silent. If the Bible is silent, then you need to be silent. Do not add to Scripture. Do not take away from Scripture. You be silent when God is silent. Now, let me give you a passage of Scripture to remind you. Okay. Deuteronomy 29, 29. Deuteronomy 29, 29. Pray for me. I still got 50 pounds to go, and I will lose that 50 pounds by the grace of Jesus Christ. Deuteronomy 29, verse 29. Okay, let's read. The secret things belong unto Jehovah, our God. The secret things, those that are secret, 
belong to God, but those things which are revealed, which are revealed, belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. Did you catch it? If God has kept something hidden from us, you have no business answering, pontificating, and seeking the answer for something that God has kept hidden, known only to himself. Deuteronomy 29, 29. If God wants you to know it, he would reveal it to you. So God wasn't pleased to make known to us the fates of dead animals. Right? But since God loves his creatures, and he loves them more than you love his creatures, trust God to do what is right, even with animals that he's created, whom he loves and he adores. Right? Everyone with me there? Everyone with me there? So that means don't ask me what happens to animals when they die. I don't know. Nobody knows. But I can tell you, and go back to my previous session and listen to the evidence. I can tell you on the basis of scripture, animals are soulish creatures like humans. They are living souls like humans. They have souls and spirits like humans. Don't let someone tell you otherwise. That is irrefutable from scripture. Right? Now, with that said, Brother Bass, don't ask me about debating James White. Focus. You're allowing Satan to distract you, and you're not focusing. See, now you're all about the debate with James White, and you're not listening. Now, let's get into the extent of the atonement. Let's go back to Colossians 1. Let's read verses 15 and 16. Colossians 1, verses 15 and 16. Sorry, it's slowing down. Holy Tornado, you thought wrong. Go back and listen to my session. Whoever taught you that, they didn't teach you from the Bible. Colossians 1, 15 and 16. Let's read. Let's read. Who is the image of the invisible God? Speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him... Okay. Okay, Enoch, you need to leave the, my page, brother. Bye-bye, Enoch. You got to go, man. Sorry, hold on. Sorry, guys. Let me just put it here. Okay, bye-bye, bro. Sorry, sorry. Hold on. Take care, brother. Sorry. Sorry about that. Hold on. Here we go. Sorry. Okay. Okay, come back here. Let's come back. Let's focus now. All right. I just got done saying, go listen to my previous session where we provide irrefutable exegetical proof from scriptures. They are soulish creatures with souls and spirits. And this guy tells me they don't have. So, okay, well, that's fine. Then this is not for you. And just real quickly, I had a dear brother who loves me, was trying to speak into my life and tell me, you know, just he's worried for me and he's praying for me. I don't follow the path of destruction. And I take his advice. And I beg the Lord Jesus Christ for that mercy that the Holy Spirit who owns me and possesses me will seal me and not allow me to follow that path. But let me just share some with you guys. This, this channel may not be for you, and I may not be the teacher for you to listen to. Sorry, man, I got to shave my chest hairs. I know that's disgusting. Forgive me. I'm a hairy Middle Easterner. What do you expect? You may need to go find someone else to teach you, right? Someone that you agree with. Right. I'm not here. I don't want you to blindly follow what I have to say. But when I've given you evidence to prove a, a position and if you still want to agree, then keep it between you and the Lord. But if you're going to pontificate without hearing the evidence, this is not for you. OK. So I hope that's clear. Let's begin. Colossians 1, 15 and 16. Let's look at 16 again. See, that's why Romina likes my Bible study, because I'm in your face and I go for the juggler. I'm not politically correct. And she likes that because she's Middle Eastern or two. Actually, she's a Syrian, and, she, you know, she knows real warriors are not politically correct. I got to admit, though, guys, you got to admit, even though I haven't got my muscles back yet, I haven't got my muscles back yet. I'm getting there slowly to get my muscles back, right? I am one gorgeous Assyrian hunk of humanity. I'm getting there. Don't hate. Women, don't swoon, please. Don't swoon. Okay, now, Colossians 1, focus with me, guys, focus with me. 
I haven't been able to hit the gym in a while, but I've been doing some cardio. Colossians 1, 15, 16, in Jesus' name, Lord Jesus, anoint this session for your glory and keep me focused for your glory and fill us with your love for your glory, Lord Jesus. Okay. Colossians 1, 16, let's read. Who's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Now read with me, folks. Read with me, because this is going to tell you. And I actually went in depth in the previous session, so I'm trying not to repeat. Try not to repeat, right, what I taught in the previous session, even though I may mention some points in passing. Now read with me verse 16. Guys, please, in Jesus' name, for the love of Christ, read this passage. You got to read this passage. For by him were all things created. Now, you ask anyone, is there anything excluded from Christ's work of creation? In other words, when it says, by Jesus Christ, by him, the firstborn of the Father, all things, tapanta, were created. Will they deny that this means that Jesus Christ created every creature in existence? Jesus Christ brought the entire creation into being and everything in heaven and earth. They won't deny it because the language is clear. In fact, let's finish it. By him, all things were created that are in heaven, that are on the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or, or powers, all things were created by him and for him. So no, if you ask anyone, you start with 16, you ask anyone, when it says the Lord created all things, sorry, it's a little slow, it's buffering. Sorry about that. This is the best we can do. When it says the Lord Jesus Christ created all things in heaven on earth, is there a thing in heaven on earth that Jesus didn't create? Does all things mean everything? Right? Does all things mean everything? In this context, they'll say yes, because Paul exhausts the language. He says, in heaven, in earth, everything in heaven and earth that was created, Jesus created. Right? Clear? Okay, now let's go to Colossians 1.20. Let's see if you make the connection. Colossians 1.20. Now go back and listen to the previous session because I went in-depth on this, and then I went in-depth on whether animals, birds have souls and spirits. Colossians 1.20. This is the same Paul. Read with me. And having made peace. Okay, sorry. Buffering. Buffering. Sorry, it's buffering. That's what it is. Okay, let's read 20, 120 again. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things, same Greek, tapanta, unto himself. So Jesus, by the blood of his cross, his death on the cross, dying on the cross, he reconciled all things to himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Did you catch it? It's the same language. It's the same language as verse 16. 16 says, the Lord Jesus Christ created all things in heaven and earth. Verse 20 says, the Lord Jesus Christ reconciled all things, made peace for all things in earth and heaven. Now, since verse 16, no one will deny that Jesus created everything in heaven and earth. On what exegetical basis will you then reject that in verse 20, it says, everything that Jesus created in heaven and earth, he now redeemed, reconciled by his blood. That Jesus died for the redemption to redeem everything in earth and in heaven. You can't, right? You can't get around it, right? Is it clear? You can't get around it? This passage, if you understand it, folks, if you understand this passage and you know how to interpret it correctly in context, it's a nightmare to limit atonement. It's a nightmare to James White, as I will prove in our debate by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't get around it except by tap dancing. This shows that Jesus didn't just die for the elect, those whom God has chosen to save. This shows that Jesus didn't just die for human beings. Jesus died to reconcile the entire creation that's been tainted, polluted, corrupted by sin. There isn't a part of creation that hasn't been tainted, polluted, affected by sin. And so Jesus comes to reconcile everything. Now, let me respond to some objections. Here's some objections. Oh, well, then if Jesus died for everything, then that means everything will be saved so that you now are teaching universalism. And at the end, everything will be saved because Jesus died to save everything, right? Is 
Zarina, you, did you listen to the last session? Nowhere does it say the lion and the lamb will lay together. I corrected that misunderstanding, <clears throat> and I went through it. It's 1 Corinthians 11 and Isaiah 65, right, verse 24. It says the wolf and the lamb, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. You didn't listen to it? Then, sister, you missed out a lot. You got to go back and listen to it. It's the wolf and the lamb. And then it says, the lion will eat straw like the ox. Is it lagging for you guys or is it going smoothly? Because this guy is now distracting me by telling me you're getting old messages. Okay. So tell Brother Bass it's lagging on his part, not mine. Okay. Okay, so now. Let's deal with the objection. Guys, I need your attention. I know we all have short attention span, all of us, me too. Focus on what I'm saying. Okay. Since in verse 16, no one will deny that when Paul, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says, Jesus created all things in heaven and on earth, that means every creature in existence, then in verse 20, no one can deny when it says that he made peace by the blood of his cross, cross and reconciled all things in earth in heaven means that Jesus died to redeem every creature in existence, right? You can't deny it exegetically. You can't get around it. So this refutes limited atonement. It shows that Jesus didn't simply die to redeem the elect, those whom God has chosen for salvation, right? A nightmare for this position if you're going to be honest to Scripture and not force Scripture to agree with your tradition. Clear? Is that clear? So I can move on to the next point. Okay. Now, some objections. One objection is, oh, so if you're saying Jesus died for the entire creation, that means everyone gets saved, even Satan. So he's going to empty out hell. You're teaching universalism. That's what they, they accuse you of. You're teaching universalism, that Jesus died to redeem everything. So everything gets saved, and he's going to empty out hell. No. Let me refute that canard. This is what we call the fallacy of false dilemma. Fallacy of false dilemma. Let me refute that canard. Exactly, Revelation 22, 13. That's why we have that confusion, because Jesus is called the lion and the lamb. Okay, now you're ready for me to refute that false dilemma? That if Jesus died for the entire creation, that means everyone gets saved, even Satan? No. Here's what proponents of limited atonement often do, and James White is infamous for doing this, because he has to use rhetoric and appeal to emotion and force the scriptures to agree because he realizes deep down inside how biblically, exegetically bankrupt his man-made tradition is. And I'm going to demonstrate that by the grace of God. You have to make a distinction between Jesus perfectly accomplishing redemption, salvation, and Jesus applying redemption, <clears throat> salvation. Okay, there's a distinction between redemption accomplished and redemption applied. Can you remember that? See, Roscoe is getting it. God bless you, brother. You're getting it. Just because Jesus Christ, our Lord, perfectly accomplished the salvation of every creature doesn't mean that that redemption will be applied to every creature because God has <clears throat> ordained that in order for Jesus' redemptive work to be applied to you, you must believe and receive. So this is a false dilemma. It's one in which they try to impose on you because they can't refute this exegetically. I promise you, they can't refute it. That's why if you ever hear James White addressing it, say, oh, so you're preaching universalism. No, I'm not. That's your false dilemma because you can't handle the text exegetically and honestly. And glory to Jesus Christ, I'll demonstrate that in our debate. So pray for that. So let me repeat. Though Jesus Christ died to redeem every creature in existence, in earth and in heaven, that redemption will not be applied until someone believes. So the condition of appropriating, receiving the benefits of Christ's redemptive work is faith in Christ. Right? Now let me prove that to you from Paul himself. Let's go to Romans 3.25. 
Romans 3.25. You following with me so far? Okay. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation. God set forth Jesus to appease God's wrath, satisfies justice through faith in his blood. Did you catch it? How do you receive the saving benefits of Jesus Christ? When he offered himself as a sacrifice to satisfy God's justice and appease his wrath, to remove his anger towards sinners, through faith. So by faith in Jesus' blood, Jesus' sacrifice is then applied to you, and that removes God's wrath upon you. Do you want me there? Through faith in his blood. Even James White and other Calvinists will tell you that though Jesus died for the elect, the elect still remain in their sins, remain, remain severed from God, under God's wrath, until by the power of the Holy Spirit they believe in Jesus Christ. So they too believe that the elect have to come to saving faith in Jesus for God's wrath to be removed from them and for them to be reconciled to God. So they can't get around this. So that's how you refute that argument, right? If someone tells you, oh, so you're teaching universalism? No, I'm teaching the Bible. I'm teaching the Bible, right? Is that clear? There is no way around this passage. Now, someone asked me, wait, are you telling me that even angels needed redeeming? Are you telling me even angels needed redeeming? What about Hebrews 2.16? Let's go to Hebrews 2.16. I hope I'm not boring you guys. I can't speak loud because I'm at my brother's place and pray for him. It's my oldest brother. Pray the Lord Jesus bless him, his wife, children, and grandchildren, and provide for him, right? Because he's being gracious enough to allow me to do this in his home. Okay, here, Hebrews 2.16. Ah, what about this? For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Now, the King James Version renders this particular Greek construction as Jesus Christ did not take on the nature of angels. He took on the nature of the seed of Abraham. Since the seed of Abraham are humans, flesh and blood human beings, Jesus became a flesh and blood human being to identify with the seed of Abraham, to be one of them, taking their nature. But he didn't take the nature of angels in order to save angels. Right. That's why if you read other translations, in fact, if you can do me a favor, Protestant believer, cite a translation other than King James and New King James, maybe New American Standard Bible, or ESV, whatever you can, because I want to show you how they use this as an objection to refute the plain teaching of Colossians 1. Right. Yes, medic, it does. OK. But let's, let's go, and I'll get to that in my series. Let's go to another translation, Hebrews 2.16. And I hope I'm not confusing you. I'm not losing you. You know? Okay. <clears throat> poor Protestant, man. He's, he's got to keep up with me, poor guy. Okay. ESV, for surely it's not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. So he goes, ah, Sam, we got you. Your interpretation, Colossians 1, contradicts Hebrews 2.16. The Lord Jesus did not take on the nature of angels. Or if you go with this translation, he didn't come to help angels. Therefore, he could not have possibly died for angels. Au contraire. Are you ready for me to respond to this, Kennard? This is an objection that people often raise. Are you now ready for me to show you why you should never use this passage to refute the plain reading of Colossians 1? Are you guys ready? Because I need your undivided attention for the glory of Jesus as the Holy Spirit anoints us for the glory of Jesus. Are you ready? Okay. Number one, no matter what this passage says, it cannot undermine, refute the plain interpretation of Colossians 1. Meaning, I don't care how you interpret this passage. Colossians 1 is clear. The same Jesus who created all things in heaven and on earth is the same Jesus who reconciled all things in earth and in heaven. The language is the same. It's only the order reversed. Colossians 1.16, it says, He created all things in heaven and on earth. 20 starts with the earth and works its way up to heaven. He reconciled all things, making peace by the blood of his cross, things 
in earth and in heaven. So if the first part, Colossians 1.16, where it says Christ created all things in heaven and earth means every creature in heaven and earth, then the second part, verse 20, which uses identical language, Christ reconciled all things in earth and in heaven, has to mean what it says, Jesus died to reconcile everything. So I don't care how many passages you quote, it will not refute the plain interpretation of that passage in context. You hear me there? Colossians 1 says what it says. Colossians 1 says what it says. Are you, are you with me there? Do you want to make sure you follow me? So however you want to interpret Hebrews 2.16, it's not going to undermine that passage. Secondly, let me now quote Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, same book of Hebrews, same book of Hebrews, huh? same book of Hebrews. Let's go to Hebrews 9, 22 to 23. Hebrews 9, 22, 23. Now watch what happens here. And this is going to show you why Bible translations are important. Okay, Hebrews 9, 22, 23. Guys, I really need you to pay attention to this passage. I really need you to pay attention. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no re remission. Now watch this. All things need to be purged by blood. It says almost all things, right? There are a few exceptions. So let's be accurate and faithful to Scripture. Now 23, guys. I need you to listen here. 23. Medic. When you ask me a question that has to take me off topic, you're not learning your lesson, brother. And I love you, and I know you love me. You have a habit of asking questions that will take me off topic. Why do you keep doing this, brother? Honestly, can you help me understand why do you do this? Because it's a repeated pattern, and it's not like you don't know. Hebrews 9, 23. It was therefore necessary that the pattern of the things in heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Okay, let's look at Hebrews 9, 23 one more time. Okay, one more time. One more time, now read it. Notice what he's saying. It was therefore necessary that the pattern of these things, the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Did you catch it? Okay, did you catch what he's saying? He's saying the earthly tabernacle, the earthly temple, is a pattern of the things in heaven. The earthly tabernacle, the sacrifices on earth to purify the earthly tabernacle, patterns of the things in the heavens. So the heavenly tabernacle, the heavenly tent, the heavenly temple, is the reality, and the earthly temple in Jerusalem is a shadow. It's not the reality. It's a shadow of the reality. But I want you to understand what he just said. The earthly tabernacle needed to be purified by the blood of bulls and goats, of animals. It needed to be purified because of human contamination, sinful humans approaching it, defiling it. But then Hebrews 9.23 says, the heavenly temple, the heavenly tabernacle, the reality Need to be purified by better sacrifices than these. Question. Why would the heavenly temple, the temple in heaven, need to be purified by better sacrifices than these? And then secondly, doesn't this show that when Jesus died, he didn't just die to purify the earth, but he also died to purify the heaven, heavens itself and the temple itself, the temple in which he sits on God's throne as the high priest? You catch it or no? Let's look at it again. Hebrews 9, 23. Hebrews 9, 23. Thank you, King of Kings. You're getting it. King of Kings is getting it. Here goes. Hebrews 9, 23. Read it and pay attention so I'm not making it up. The heavenly temple where God the Father dwells on his throne, and Jesus is on the throne with him as our high priest, where there are myriads of angels who serve God. 
and where the disembodied spirits of believers, those believers who died in Christ, their spirits go to dwell, that needed to be purified by better sacrifices. And what are those better sacrifices? The sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you with me here? So the same book of Hebrews, you got a king of kings. The same book of Hebrews, listen to this. The same book of Hebrews that said Jesus doesn't take the nature of angels or helps angels. I prefer the King James rendering of the Greek. Also says that heaven itself, the temple in heaven itself, needed to be purified by better sacrifices. So even Hebrews does not deny, does not limit Jesus' death to human beings. Even Hebrews teaches that Jesus' sacrifice and the blood that he shed purifies the heavenly temple and heaven itself. Did you catch it? Are you catching it or no? So that means if you're going to read Hebrews 2.16 to argue that Jesus didn't die to atone for angels, you're misreading Hebrews 2.16. You're misreading Hebrews 2.16. You're pitting Hebrews against Hebrews and pitting Hebrews against Colossians 1. Are you with me there? Before I answer the question, Jason, just walk with me. I'm trying to walk you through this. So if you interpret Hebrews 2.16 to show that Jesus did not atone for angels, then not only are you having Hebrews contradict Colossians, you're having the author of Hebrews contradict himself. Because in Hebrews 9, he admits that Jesus' sacrifice atones and purifies heaven itself and the temple in heaven. Well, it doesn't say Lucifer did, but it's okay. Let's not get into too many places. Thank you, Libertas. Now, let me show you why Bible translations are important. Let me show you why Bible translations are important. Tony, I'll get there. If you guys be patient, you're getting too excited. See, that's one thing. We don't have patience. Wait. I'll get there. Just be patient. Let's go now to Revelation 5, 8 to 10. You want further? Well, this is not further proof because it depends on the translation you use. Yeah, I'm going to walk you through it and refute the common typical objections. There is no objection against this, and this is a nightmare. It actually refutes and decimates limited atonement. Revelation 5, 8 to 10, read with me. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts, pay attention who's speaking, who's going to be praising Jesus. Pay attention, read 8. The four beasts and four and twenty elders, the twenty-four elders, fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. And they sung a new song. So the four beasts, the four living creatures, the cherubim slash seraphim, and the twenty-four elders sang a new song. Notice what they sing. Thou worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain, you were slain, and hast redeemed us. Wow. The manuscripts underlying the King James Version, the New King James Version, and modern English Version say that the four living creatures and the 24 elders are praising the Lamb for redeeming them as well. You redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and has made us unto our God, king and priest, and we shall reign on the earth. Do you guys see it? The four beasts, the four living creatures, the 24 elders are praising the Lamb, saying, Lamb of God, Lord Jesus, you didn't just redeem human beings. You redeemed us spirit creatures as well with human beings from every tribe, nation, and tongue, and have made all of us, ourselves included, to be a kingdom of priests serving God. Uh, but hold on, folks. Hold on. This is where your Bible version matters. Now let's look at the ESV, ESV, and see how ESV renders Revelation 5, 9 to 10. You can skip 8, 
brother. And if you look at the ESV, right? And I'm going to give you the link. Okay. Okay. Revelation 5, 9 to 10. This is ESV. Guys, see if you notice the difference. Can you spot the difference? And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. Do you see what changed? Do you see the difference in the modern versions based on what they call the eclectic texts, earlier Greek manuscripts? The four living creatures and the 24 elders do not say, you ransomed us. You see it? doesn't say that. It says ransom people. But guess what, folks? And you've made them a kingdom of priests to our God. Here's the Greek underlying the modern versions. Here's the Greek. The word people is not there. It's not in the Greek. Can you do me a favor and click on it? There is no people in the Greek. There is no men in the Greek. If you look at it, you read it. It says, <clears throat> let me look at it. You'll see it if you look at it. It's You don't even need to read the Greek. They provide the Greek in transliteration and also the words. It's you purchase to God by the blood of you out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. No word for people or men. Literally, it's you purchase for God by your blood from every tribe, tongue, and people and nation. The word people, and I believe NIV has men, is supplied. It's not in the Greek. It's not in the Greek. Now, let me just double check the Greek manuscripts underlying the King James. Let me just double check. Hold on. You see why Bible translations are important and Bible manuscripts are important? Here, let me see the Greek here. Okay. Yep. The Greek underlying the King James has the word us. Here you go. Don't take my word for it. Here's the link. Okay. The Greek manuscripts from which the King James was produced, the Greek manu manuscripts from which the new King James version is produced, those Greek manuscripts have the word us. You don't need to know, need, know the Greek. There it goes. There's a link, blueletterbible.org. Thank the Lord Jesus for modern technology. All right? And it's right there. It's Himes, Himas, however you want to pronounce the Greek, Erasmian while or the Greek way, right? To Theo, Himas, and to Aimati, Suek, Pases. Right? Do you see it? The Greek word us is there. Everyone see it? I want you to read it for yourself and confirm that I'm not making it up. But anyway, okay, then just then you're gonna have to take my word for it. So now you understand how not all Bibles are equal. If you follow the King James, right? Marshall, if you be patient, I'll get there, brother. Trust me, in Jesus' name, I'll get there. If you follow the King James, or if you follow translations based on the fam same family of manuscripts, Greek manuscripts, known as the Byzantine text or the majority text, because from these majority of Greek witnesses, we get the subset of the received text, Textus Recept Receptus, which underlies the King James. The four living creatures, the four beasts, and the 24 elders say that the Lord Jesus redeemed us too. We were redeemed. So you see why your Bible translation is important? Why not all translations are equal? And why... You have to know what Bible to read and stick with. So if you want to stick with the ESV and you believe that the Greek manuscripts underlying the English Standard Version ESV or the NIV, New International Version, or New American Standard Bible, those are superior, then stick with it. Stick with it and believe that it is 100% the pure words of God preserved in your language. You with me there? Stick with the translation you believe. In my estimation, and I'm going to say this and I'm going to get attacked for it, I have argued myself 
into this position. In other words, I argued and reasoned myself to this view. I truly believe, and I know people are going to attack me, and it doesn't mean I have answers to every objection, but because of my trust in God's faithfulness and goodness and his providential preservation of his word, I have now come to believe the King James Version is the best translation in English, and it is the pure words of God in English, preserved by God, as a faithful word to his church. I came to that conviction and conclusion on my own, and I'm not here trying to convince you, and it's not because I'm trying to chicken out, because to be honest, there are objections that both sides can't answer. For example, there are objections against this position of mine that I don't have answers for, but there are also objections against the other position that they can't answer. So at the end of the day, it's going to have to be something you're convicted of and something you take by faith. It's not blind faith. It's faith in God's goodness, faithfulness, fidelity, and power to preserve his word perfectly and to give the church access to his perfect word. You hear me there? And that's my conviction. Now, do I accept the reading in, of the King James in Revelation 5, 9? Absolutely. I just told you that I'm convinced that the King James is the best translation of God's words in English. In fact, the King James are the pure words of God preserved perfectly in English. That's my conviction. You want to condemn me, say I'm become a fanatic? You can do what you want. Okay, that's my conviction. Now, one of the reasons why, one of the reasons why I've come to this conviction, here's, here's, here's my reason. You want to hear it real quickly? Real quickly? I don't have all the answers to all the objections against this position, but neither does the other side have all the answers to all the objections against their position. So at the end of the day, it's going to be, be something between you and the Holy Spirit and your conviction. That's between you and the Holy Spirit. So if you want to accept the SV and NIV, God bless you. I'm not going to try to convince you otherwise. As long as you believe you have a perfect word from God, and you trust your Bible and follow it completely by the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Jesus Christ, okay? But as you can see, they're not identical. That doesn't mean they're so different. You're going to get a different theology, a different teaching about Christ, different salvation. No, no, no. You're going to get the same theology, same view of Jesus, same view of the Holy Spirit, same message of salvation, right? Okay, but now follow me. Here's my reason why I accept this reading, Revelation 5, 9, in the King James. Can I give you my reason and bore you with it? I hope it's a blessing and challenging you. Here's why. You ready? It pleased the triune God. It pleased the triune God for over 300 years to make the King James Bible based on a certain set of Greek manuscripts. And they consulted other versions like the Latin as well. It pleased the sovereign triune God who is real, who is life, because if he didn't exist, we wouldn't exist. To make the King James Bible the chief translation for English-speaking Christians for over 300 years without a close rival. Do you know that? That means all over the English-speaking world, for over 300 years, people read the same English translation, read the same readings, and all of them believe that what they were reading is thus saith the Lord. You with me there? Now, let's argue that the King James was based on defective manuscripts with defective readings so that that word us in Revelation 5.9 shouldn't be there. Now, let me give you the opposite position. Are you ready now for the opposite view? Why I rejected what's known as... The eclectic text view, where they put a priority over the earliest witnesses as being closer to the originals and more likely to contain the original readings, right? And I'm simplifying textual criticism, obviously. But let's take their position. According to them, passages such as Revelation 5.9, where it has the word us, that's not what John originally wrote. That's an interpolation. Are you with me here? Us shouldn't be there. That was added 
later in the stream of the New Testament manuscripts, in the textual stream, right? That means for over 300 years, the sovereign triumph God allowed English-speaking Christians to cite a passage with an extra word, believing that extra word was inspired by the Spirit, and quoting it authoritatively as the four living creatures and the 24 elders affirming Jesus and praising Jesus for redeeming them as well, without realizing that word us wasn't originally part of what John wrote. It was an interpolation. So for over 300 years, God allowed them to cite it as thus saith the Lord, as part of God breathed scripture, even though they were mistaken and God allowed them to quote it anyway. See the problem with that view? You see why I have a problem with this view? You're either going to end up like a Bart Ehrman who says that, well, if God didn't make sure we had access to the original wording of the original manuscripts because of the variant readings, then why should I believe that God even inspired the originals? That's how he argued himself out of faith. Do you know that? Because of the variant readings and the differences, he concluded, well, God must have not inspired the originals to begin with. You, you with me there? But let me give you another example. First John 5, 7. There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. First John 5, 7. That's found in the King James, New King James, and Modern English Version because they're all based on the same family of manuscripts with the New King James prioritizing what's known as the majority text. Okay, here, 1 John 5, 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Lord, the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Now, pick up a translation that's based on the earlier Greek witnesses, and you'll see that either they don't have verse 7 or they've split verse 8 into two to make up for verse 7, and then they have a note saying, that the earliest Greek witnesses do not contain this passage. Now, why is this interesting? I want you to go on YouTube. Don't take my word for it. Do a search for 1 John 5, 7 and put Ahmadidat or put Muslims. And then do a search for 1 John 5, 7 and put Bart Ehrman. This is the passage that all anti-Trinitarians and liberals who believe the Bible is corrupt point to as proof that the Bible has been corrupted and that God either didn't inspire the Bible because it's not his word or as an argument that the Bible isn't God's word because there's no God to begin with. You, you with me there? The Muslims use it to show that the Bible is not his word, but the Quran is. Do you know why? Bart Ehrman uses it to show the Bible can't be inspired because there's no God to begin with. But he lost his faith in God for other reasons. The, the the issue of suffering. But do you know why? You know why they argue that? Bart Ehrman and Ahmed Didat and Muslims like Ahmed Didat say the clearest, in fact, the only explicit verse, the only expli explicit witness to the Trinity is 1 John 5, 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Three and one. That's what the word Trinity means. Try, three, unity. Three and one, one and three. This is the clearest, most explicit reference to the Trinity, and it's found in one passage. However, it's an interpolation, they'll tell you. John did not write this. It's not part of what John wrote. It is a later scribal insertion, maybe a note left by a scribe in the margin that a later scribe included as part of the main text, and they use this to, to prove, see, you see, your Bible is corrupt. Because a passage that was cited for over 300 years by Christians who believe that the King James Bible is a perfect translation of God's words in English used it to prove the Trinity and they were mistaken. They were mistaken. So here's my question to every one of you. Are you ready for my question? If we believe God is real and he is. And the triumph God exists, and he does. And Jesus is alive, and Jesus is alive, can never die again. And the Bible is the word of God, and it is. And God, in his sovereign power, will make sure to give his church access to his pure word. 
then why did God allow for over 300 years English-speaking Christians to cite the chief English translation, the King James Bible, and to quote a passage found in the King James Bible, 1 John 5, 7, as proof for the Trinity, believing it's inspired of God, thus saith the Lord, when, according to critics like Bart Ehrman, critics like James White, critics like Daniel Wallace, and even anti-Trinitarians like Muslims, was never part of what John originally wrote. Because John never wrote that by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So where was God to guide the church to the correct set of manuscripts and guide the church to include only those verses that he inspired and not allow the church to cite verses that, according to these critics, shouldn't have been there to begin with. And yet for over 300 years, these Christians quoted it as, Thus saith the Lord, and God did nothing to prevent them from quoting the wrong passages to prove correct doctrine. Do you see, you? if you follow this path, contrary to what James White will tell you, and he can do dozens of DLs attacking me, attacking others, because that's all he can do. If he can do, I mean, I mean, if, if, if you follow James White, you end up with a position that's not faith building, faith producing, but faith destroying. Did you know that? Thank you, Zarina. So I came to the conclusion whether I, I may have may or may not have now follow me. Whether I may or may not have enough manuscript evidence to show me that first John 5 7 is original. I'm going to take a step of faith and believe that it is part of what John originally wrote by inspiration, which is why God allowed for John 5 7 to appear in the chief translation for English-speaking Christians for over 300 years. Otherwise, God would have moved his church in such a way not to include it. See, this is a statement of faith. This is a position of faith. It's because I trust in the triune God, in his goodness, in his power, to give us a sure word, I come to that conclusion. So notice my presupposition. I'm starting with the triune God, his existence, his power, his faithfulness, Right, And that the Bible is his word, and he's going to make sure the church has access to his pure word, that I then arrive at the conclusion that 1 John 5, 7 must be original. You get my point? Now, people are going to laugh at me, especially James White, who thinks he's a champion in defending the accurate transmission of the New Testament, when in reality his position is faith-destroying, not faith-producing or building. Right? He sounds like Bart Ehrman, even though he's trying to use the same argument that Ehrman uses to arrive at a different conclusion from Ehrman. They use the same criteria, folks, the same science of textual criticism. And yet Bart Ehrman, in employing that method, ended up losing faith in the Bible. Yet James White wants to use that method to arrive at a different conclusion that the Bible's preserved. You with me? And it's not just James White. I just sing him out because he thinks he's an expert at the New Testament textual transmission, and he's not. He's nothing but a parrot, right? But you with me there? You can if you want, Lewis. Lewis, if you want to say CJB, which, again, is that the complete Jewish Bible? That's fine. So whatever you find in the complete Jewish Bible, Lewis, you're willing to say, this is 100% the pure words of God preserved. And you're not willing to stray from that. Okay, that's between you and God. You with me there? But then you still have the problem, Lewis, with this. Are you ready? Where was the complete Jewish Bible for the last 400 years when God in his sovereign pleasure made the King James Bible the chief translation for English-speaking Christians for over 300 years. So what happened before the CJB? Because for over 300 years, the King James was unrivaled. So you're going to still have to answer why the King James and why those readings that are peculiar to the King James that even the CJB does not include. 
So that doesn't solve the problem for you. Love and light. The evidence is overwhelming that the story of the woman caught in adultery is original and that John did write it by inspiration, as well as the longer ending of Mark 69 and 20. I'm going to give a plug for James E. Snap. James E. Snap, S-N-A-P-P -P Jr., sometimes joins me on the live show, and he disagrees with my position, by the way. He is one of the leading authorities and experts on the Transmission New Testament, and he's written fabulous books, and he has fabulous posts refuting the misinformation by people like James White and Daniel Wallace concerning the woman caught in adultery and the longer ending of Mark and demonstrating historically and textually these are verses inspired by the Holy Spirit and are part of the Gospels of Mark and John. You with me there? James E. Snap, S-N-A-P-P. -P. Okay, so is that clear? Now, I gave you my reasons. Listen to me. I gave you my reasons why I came to this conclusion. I'm not saying I can answer all the objections, but neither can the other side answer all objections, nor I'm saying that you should follow me. I'm giving you what led me to this position, and let me repeat why I came to this conclusion. Are you ready? Let me repeat why I came to this conclusion. Even though for years I would mock the King James only position and those who were Texas Receptus only or majority text only. I used to mock them and laugh at them. Okay. You want to hear again my reason why I came to that position? One more time so you guys understand. Okay. Here's why. I didn't come to this position solely because of textual criticism or arguments for this reading being superior to that. I started with the presupposition of God. The triune God exists, and he does exist. He is reality. Jesus Christ is Lord, and he's alive. Thank you. I will, but it's Coke Zero. I know you want me to get healthy, but I'm taking steps, baby steps, brother. Let's focus on this, not on Coke Zero. Okay? The triune God exists. Jesus Christ is risen. He is Lord. He's alive. The Bible is his word, and God is faithful and powerful enough to preserve his word and to make sure that his church, the bride of Christ, has access to his pure word. It's because of those assumptions that I came to the conclusion that God must have been pleased with the King James because for over 300 years, God in his pleasure allowed the King James to be the chief translation for English-speaking Christians who all read the same translation in English for over 300 years with all these readings that scholars today, like James White, who's not a scholar of, the text, of New Testament textual criticism, even though he wants to you know, make himself out to be one, he's not. Sorry, he's not. But scholars like Daniel Wallace say are defective and shouldn't be in the Bible. So where was God making sure that his church did not include or read defective passages or words to passages that, according to them, were not inspired by the original authors of Scripture? So I couldn't follow that route. So I'm starting with God. Triune God, Christ is alive, he's all-powerful, the Bible is God's word, and God is faithful and good and will keep his promise and good enough to keep his promise to give his church access to that word that he wants them to have access to. And for over 300 years, that was the King James. And even to this day, folks, I don't know if you know it. I don't know if you're aware of it. The King James Bible is still the best-selling translation next to the NIV, and most churches still use the King James. Did you know that? So this is how I came to this position, to this conclusion. It wasn't through the science of textual criticism. And folks, can I tell you another thing? And this is something admitted by Daniel Wallace and James White and others. Did you know that the field of New Testament textual criticism has been taken over by textual critics who no longer believe that you can recover the original wording of the original autographs? Did you know this? The scholars who have now taken over, who are the most influential 
in the field of New Testament textual criticism believe that you can only get back to the 4th century, 300s. But you can't get back to the original wording of the original autographs that were produced by the Spirit in the 1st century. Do you know that? They don't even try anymore. They've given up on it. And this is the same field of textual criticism that folks like James White want to employ to tell us what the original wording of the original autographs happened to be. Is everyone with me or am I confusing you? Am I boring you? Am I torturing you? Or are you enjoying this? Romy and everyone else, is this educating you and challenging you to think more deeply? Okay. So th this is my reason, or I should say these are my reasons. This is what I believe. You don't have to believe like me. You can say I'm a nut. I'm a fanatic. That's okay. I'd rather be called a fanatic and a nut for believing that I have a perfect word of God in English and trusting God by the power of the Spirit to give me the power to submit to that perfect word and model my life after for the glory of Jesus, right? Then follow this dangerous trend, right? Now, Lewis, you see what you did, Lewis? You know I'm going to have to get rid of you. God is faithful to give people his pure word in their languages. We're talking about English because I'm an English speaker. Do you want me to speak about Swahili? Lewis, do you want to get blocked for that? That's my position. So, folks, you want to say Sam is a nut, Texas Receptus nut, majority text nut, King James, that's okay. Call me what you want. I don't care. That's my conviction. That's what I believe. And now I pray that I remain true to my conviction, trusting the Holy Spirit to empower me now to take that perfect word in my language that I understand and live it out powerfully for the glory of Jesus Christ. Right? Okay. So buffering. Okay, with that said, let's get back to the issue, and I'm going to talk about the woman caught in adultery. Are you ready? According to Hebrews 9, 22, 23, did our Lord Jesus Christ purify the heavenly temple, heaven itself, with his sacrifice, which is superior to all animal sacrifices on earth? Hebrews 9, 22, 23. Was that clear? Okay. Is it further clear that in Colossians 1, 16 to 20, the, the text says clearly, irrefutably, if you exegete it honestly and correctly, that the same Jesus Christ who created all things in heaven and on earth is the same Jesus Christ who reconciled all things in earth and in heaven, which means no one is exempt. All creatures in heaven, all creatures on earth, all creation was reconciled by the blood of Jesus. Is that clear? So why would our Lord Jesus need to redeem even heavenly creatures? So if we go with the reading, found the King James, New King James, Modern English Version, Revelation 5, 9. Let's look at it again. If we go with that reading, it says that Jesus didn't just redeem human beings from every tribe, language, and tongue, right? Nation, tribe, tongue, however you want to. He also redeemed the four beasts, the four living creatures, and the 24 elders. And clearly they're not human creatures. Here it goes. Revelation 5, 9 and 10. And they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and has redeemed us to God by the blood out of every kindred and tongue and people nation. Notice, redeemed us. They're including themselves as well. And tongue and people nation. And has made us unto our God, kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Okay. So if you go with the reading found in King James, New King James, Modern English Version. The Lord Jesus, by his blood, redeemed even heavenly creatures. But you don't even need that. You can put it aside. Hebrews 9, 22, 23 says the same thing. He purified heaven, the temple in heaven, obviously in its inhabitants, by better sacrifices, meaning his sacrifice, his blood. That's clear, and Colossians 1 is clear. So the question is, why would angels need to be redeemed? Why would angels need to be redeemed? Uh, Leslie, very true, and you need to leave. Bye-bye. I don't, I don't understand why people come here. They think they're going to last. You want the answer? Let's go. 
Job 4, 17 to 19. Job 4, 17, 19. Here's the answer. And by the way, John Kelvin in his commentary, if you go to John Kelvin's commentary, it's online. He says the same thing I'm about to say. In his exegesis of Colossians 1, 20, he says the same thing I'm about to say. So this is not unique to me. I actually went to read what Calvin said about the passage, and he's just going to say what I'm about to say. Are you ready? So this is John Calvin, folks. I'm going to give you the link. I should have had his quotation up and ready to read. I don't have it. But John 4, 17, 19, notice, let's read. Okay. Shall mortal man be more just than God? No. Shall a man be more pure than his maker? No. Notice verse 18. Behold, he put no trust in his servants, and his angels he charged with folly. Bam. How much less in them that dwell in houses of clay, whose foundations in the dust, which are crushed before the moth. Did you catch it? Even angels are not good enough, let alone human beings. Even angels are not good enough, let alone human beings. And John Calvin even used Job 4, 18 to make his case. Now, Job 15, 14 to 16. Job 15, 14 to 16. Church family, ecclesia, be patient. We're getting there. Job 15, verses 14 to 16. Job 15, verses 14 to 16. What is a man that he should be clean? And he which is born of a woman that he should be righteous. Behold, he putteth no trust in his saints. Here, it doesn't mean human saints. Because here the saints are being contrasted with humans. The word kadoshi means holy ones, and it can refer to angels. Behold, he puts no trust in his angels. Yea, the heavens are not clean in his sight. Did you catch it? Even heaven is not clean enough, good enough for God. How much more abominable and filthy is man, which drinketh iniquity like water? Did you catch it? Even the holy ones in heaven, heaven itself, they're not good enough for God. They're not pure enough for God, let alone man, let alone the son of man who's a maggot. Job 25, verses 4 to 6. Job 25, verses 4 to 6. Right? Job 25, verses 4 to 6. How then can man be justified with God? Or how can he be clean that is born of a woman? The answer he can't. Unless God cleanses him, sanctifies him, washes him in the blood of Jesus. Behold, even to the moon, and it shineth not. Yea, the stars are not pure in his sight. How much less a man that is a worm, and the son of man which is a worm. Did you catch it? Even the stars, the sun, the moon, the holy ones of heaven, the angels, even they are not good enough. They are not pure enough, let alone human beings. You see why now Colossians says that Jesus Christ, by his blood, purified everything in heaven on earth? Because it all need to be purified. All of it need to be cleansed because nothing in creation is good enough, pure enough in the sight of God, especially after the fall. Because the fall of Satan and evil spirits and the fall of human beings tainted, corrupted, polluted everything. Even righteous angels are not righteous enough to stand before God's presence. So Jesus, by his grace, had to make them worthy enough to stand in his presence, in the presence of the triune God. Do you see? Are you with me there? Are you with me there? So the Bible teaches even angels themselves, heaven itself is not pure enough. It's not good enough in the sight of God. And this is referring to righteous angels, those who serve him. Therefore, the blood of Jesus is necessary to make anything worthy enough to stand in the presence of God. In other words, Michael can only stand in God's presence. Gabriel can only stand in God's presence because Jesus made them worthy enough, righteous enough, pure enough to stand before the presence of the triumph God. 
Isaiah 64, 6 to 7. And John Calvin interprets it the same way. Colossians 1.20. Read his commentary in Colossians 1.20. Lest you say I'm making this up and I came up with something novel. Now, I read Calvin after, by the grace of God, I came to this position. Now, Isaiah 64, 6 to 7. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Did you catch it? Isaiah didn't say our evil deeds. He says our righteous deeds are filthy. Even our good deeds are filthy. Our prayers are filthy. Our obedience to God, that's filthy. Fasting is filthy, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. And there is none that call upon thy name, that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee, for thou hast hid thy face from us, and hast consumed us because of our iniquities. Did you catch it? Isaiah is including himself in this group. Even I, a prophet of God, a servant of God, who's preaching the word of God, I and everyone else, our righteous deeds, our good deeds are filthy rags, disgusting, we're unclean. By the way, let me tell you how graphic the language is. Sisters, I beg your pardon, but I'm going to show you how graphic the language is. You know how graphic this language is? Filthy rags is a reference to what women would use to purify and cleanse, them cleanse themselves during their monthly cycle. The rag is what a woman would use to purify herself during her period. It's a menstruation rag. I have to stretch it out because I don't want you to see my hairy chest and be tempted. I don't want to cause you to stumble and desire me. You want me there? In other words, you know what Isaiah is saying? You know what Isaiah is saying? When you present your righteous deeds before God, it's like handing God your menstrual rag. Here you go, God. Look how good I am. Handing God your menstrual rag. Rag. Disgusting, isn't it? Disgusting, isn't it? The only way you can please God, Richard, come on, the answer is obvious. Jesus Christ. That's the whole point of the Bible. The whole point of the Bible is even the most righteous of creatures are evil in the sight of God and are not worthy to stand in his presence, which is why Jesus, God Almighty in the flesh, came to do for all creation what we could not do for ourselves, make us worthy and good enough to stand in his presence. That's the, the message. So let's go to Hebrews 2.16 and explain this false dilemma. You don't need to be scared if you're trusting in Jesus, loving Jesus, hoping in Jesus, clinging to Jesus. Because he is your peace. Okay, now let's, uh, let's explain this passage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. If you read this passage, it doesn't contradict Colossians 1, Hebrews 9, 23, and Revelation 5. It simply means Jesus didn't become an angel by nature. Not because he didn't redeem them as well, but because he became a human being to identify with human beings and associate with them, right? So it's simply stating a fact. He didn't become an angel by nature. Okay, sorry, I was buffering. So if we go with the rendering found in the King James, right? Can you hear me now? Sorry. Okay. Can you hear me now? Okay. I see comments. Okay. Okay, if, if we go by the rendering King James, it simply says Jesus didn't take on the nature of an angel. True. Okay, it's going to get better. Hold on. Wait. Yeah, I'm sure. Almost done. Okay. How much time? How long have I done? It's what? Oh, 84 minutes. Okay. We're going to end it then soon. Okay. It's true. Okay. He simply didn't take the nature of an angel. That's it. He didn't. Okay. But what if we go with the other rendering of the Greek? Where he does not help angels, but he helps the sons of Abraham. Hebrews 2.16. 
Would that be in conflict with what we've established? Hebrews 2.16. Let's look at it in the ESV. I can go if I can go another 30 minutes if you will, if you want, because I want to unpack John 8, the story of the, adult, of the adulterous woman and why it's a powerful testimony to Jesus being God in the flesh, if you're okay with it. Okay, here's the ESV. Let's look at the ESV rendering, and we'll, I'll do that if you're okay. ESV, Hebrews 2.16. I know, I know that, Protestant. That's why I'm waiting. I know it's not. That's why I'm waiting. Yeah, I'm sure. Hold on, guys. Let me just call this guy real quick. Okay. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Now, does this contradict all that we read? No. In the context, if you read it, in the context, Jesus comes to help fallen human beings. That means contextually, if we go with this rendering of the Greek, it says Jesus didn't come to help fallen angels, and he didn't. In other words, he didn't come to intercede for fallen angels, to help fallen angels, right? Right? And to wound them back to salvation. That's true. However, that doesn't mean he didn't offer a sacrifice to atone for all creation. Though that atonement won't be applied to every creature. Specifically to fallen angels because they won't repent. In other words, if I'm going to read this passage in such a way where it doesn't contradict with the teaching of Colossians 1 or Hebrews 9.23, or Revelation 5, if you go with the variant reading found the King James, then all this simply means is this. Jesus knowing the nature of fallen angels, that they won't repent because they're so hardened in their sin, so dead in their sin, that though he offers his, uh, his life as a sacrifice to atone for them, if they were to turn, they won't turn, and therefore he doesn't come to help them, but he comes to help human beings who can turn. You with me there? You understand how you can reconcile Hebrews 2.16 with all of Scripture? Okay, let me explain it again. It's not that Jesus didn't offer his sacrifice to make atonement, to accomplish redemption for every creature, even fallen angels. It's that his death won't be applied to them because they are so dead in sin, so hardened in sin, that they cannot turn. Even if they chose to turn because their nature is so hardened and evil that their nature has become damaged irre irrevocably, 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 so they can't turn. And therefore, there's no need for him to take on nature to help them because they're a point in their rebellion. They are a, they are at a point in their evil, in their depravity, that they cannot turn even if they wanted to, and they don't want to turn because they hate God and love evil, and therefore he doesn't come to help them, but he comes to help fallen humanity because with human beings, they can turn by the grace of God. Everyone with me there? Am I, are you, am I confusing you? But then some will say, well, why did he die for them when he knows they won't turn and benefit? The reason why he died for them is to demonstrate his love and compassion even for fallen creatures. Because remember, the devil is Jesus' devil, meaning initially when the devil was created, he was a righteous spirit creature loved by Jesus. Let me explain that. Guys, this is where I need you to listen. You must believe that at one point in time when the devil was created, he was a righteous spirit creature because Christ did not create him evil. Christ didn't create the devil as the devil, evil, rebellious, and wicked. When the devil was created, he was one of those spirit creatures that Christ created good and righteous in his sight. And the fact that he created him means he loved him enough to create him. So by dying, even for his sinfulness, 
Jesus is showing the extent of his love and why Satan deserves the wrath that's going to be poured upon him. Because Jesus can say this, look, not only did I create you righteous and upright, and I gave you beauty and powers and wisdom. And how did you respond? You turned against me, rebelled against me, and declared war against me and my creatures. A war that you insist on winning. A war that you won't stop fighting till the very end. I even went to the extent of dying for your rebellion. And this is how you repay your creator. Complete defiance and rebellion till the end. <clears throat> Therefore, you deserve the hell that I'm about to send you into. You get the point? So why did Jesus waste his time dying for him? He didn't waste his time. It was to demonstrate his love even for fallen angels, fallen spirit creatures, rebellious spirit creatures that he created good. And he created because he loved them. Otherwise, why, why would he create them? Showing that even you, even you, I will accomplish your redemption. But in response, you will continue rebelling, continue defying me, continue destroying my creation, continue declaring war against me till the very end, so that you truly deserve the wrath that's about to come upon you. Because I did everything to show you my love and my grace. Even my patience towards you, that I tolerate your evil till the very end. Why were you worried, Zarina? You understand? So however you want to interpret Hebrews 2.16, however you want to interpret Hebrews 2.16, you can't interpret in such a way to refute the plain exegesis, Colossians 1, 16 to 20, which irrefutably shows that Christ accomplished the redemption of every creature in heaven and earth. Can't get around that. Or the plain reading of Hebrews 9.23, which says that Jesus purified heaven and the heavenly temple with better sacrifices. Can't get around that. Okay. So, however you want to interpret Hebrews 2.16, you can't interpret in such a way to refute, contradict, undermine the plain irrefutable exegesis Colossians 1 16 to 20 which says that Christ accomplished redemption for every creature in heaven and earth can't get around that right okay and you can't get around the plain reading of Hebrews 9 23 which says that Jesus purified heaven and the temple of heaven with better sacrifices can't get around that you may get around Revelation 5 9 because of the variant reading but you can't get around these other passages. So however you want to he interpret Hebrews 2.16, you cannot interpret it to undermine the plain reading of Colossians 1 and Hebrews 9.23. You with me there? Clear? Before I move on? All right, just want to make sure it's still buffering a little bit, but it's getting better. Okay. Amen. Okay. Now, if you're ready, I want to end it with John 8. John 7, 53, 8, 11. Now, why do I end this? Because this is the one that, unfortunately, because of modern textual criticism and your text notes, cast doubt on its authenticity lessening if not destroying your confidence in citing this as inspired scripture and yet it's one of the most powerful witnesses to jesus being jehovah god in the flesh are you listening because of modern textual criticism and because of text notes and your modern versions many people are afraid to quote john 7 verse 53 the chapter 8 verse 11 the story of the woman caught in adultery because they have how do I put this? Their confidence in the inspiration and authority of that passage has been lessened, if not completely effaced, because of modern textual criticism and textual notes, right? And yet John 7, 53 to 8, 11, chapter 8, verse 11, is one of the most powerful witnesses to Jesus being the Jehovah God of the Old Testament. Did you know that? 
Are you ready for me to show you why I say that? Now, many of you already know how this proves that Jesus is God Almighty in the flesh because you've heard me talk about this in previous sessions, and some of you already discovered it on, you, on your own by the grace of God's Spirit. But I want to enlighten you. Okay, are you ready for me to go into the meat? And we'll end it. See, Jesus is our Passover new. Okay, now, what's the context? Let me break the context if you're ready. If you're ready, in Jesus' name, may the internet connectivity be strong. Please, Lord. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so okay. Okay. The context is they caught a woman in adultery. Pay attention now. Pray, Richard, I give all, all of me, 100% of me to Jesus because I'm far from it. Pray I can love Jesus more than this human life, right? Okay, now let me explain the context and please, Lord Jesus, bless the internet connect connectivity, okay? Yeah, okay, follow me. A woman is caught in adultery. They bring the woman to Jesus. Pay attention here. A woman is caught in adultery. They bring the woman to Jesus and they tell Jesus that according to law, Moses should be, she should be stoned. What say you? That's the context. Now, if Jesus says stone her, then they can bring an accusation against him to the Roman civil authority saying he's inciting insurrection because the Jews did not have a legal right to kill anyone. So if he says, yes, yeah, she should be stoned, they can accuse him before the Roman authorities and saying he's starting He's, you know, he's he's pretty much encouraging violence to take the law into their own hands because we can't kill anyone. But if he says, no, don't stone her, then they can accuse him of being a false prophet for contradicting the law of Moses. Because the law of Moses says, if you catch a person adultery, stone that person, right? So either way, they try to make Jesus look bad, correct? You with me there? Now, here's what I want you to write down. We're not going to look at it. I want you to write down Deuteronomy 22, 13 to 30. Deuteronomy chapter 22, verses 13 to 20. I'm sorry. Deuteronomy 22, verses 13 to 30. Write down Deuteronomy 22, verses 13 to 30. Read it at your own leisure because that's the chapter in the law of Moses that talks about certain sexual sins and their punishment. Okay? Now, according to law of Moses, when a person is caught in adultery... Both the man and the woman are to be brought before the elders and stoned. Now, Jesus says something. Pay attention. I need your attention now. He says, he's without, sin, so, st uh, la, 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 la. he's without sin cast the first stone. And it says, one by one, they walked away. Do you know why they walked away? I always wondered to myself, why didn't just someone out of spite, to spite Jesus, throw the stone? Y'all really? I'm without sin and throw the first stone just to spite him. Do you know why no one threw a stone to spite Jesus? Do you know why? No, not because they're guilty of sexual sin. In bringing the woman, they were in sin. And they knew that Jesus would call them out for it. In bringing the woman, they were in sin. Do you know why? Because the law says you're to bring the man and the woman. Why did they just bring the woman, not the man? Because for them to know she committed adultery, they had to know the man she committed adultery with. So why did they bring the man? In bringing the woman, they were in sin already. And they knew they were being hypocrites and Jesus would call them up for their hypocrisy. You hear me there? So that's why they knew better than to cast the first stone. Because they say, wait, 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 you're sinless? For you to know this woman's in, uh, committed adultery, you must know the man she committed adultery with. Why didn't you bring the man? You're in sin already because you went against the law of Moses. Bam. Stop them dead in their tracks, right? You want me there? Stop them dead in their tracks. Yes, he is. Jesus is a genius because he's the infinite wisdom, knowledge of the Father in the flesh. You can't catch him because he's the one who revealed the law and knows what the law means. Okay, so you caught that, right? 
you, if you got that point, let me move on to where the text shows that Jesus is the God of the Old Testament, the God who spoke to Moses, the God who gave Moses the law. Yes, thank you, Leviticus 20.10, but it's also in Deuteronomy 22.13-30. to 30. Okay, now, let's go to John and read chapter 8, verse 6 and verse 8. John, chapter 8, verse 6 and verse 8. Watch here. Almost done. Watch here, guys. This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down. Pay attention now. Stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So he's writing on the ground with his finger to this day. That's puzzled theologians. Why is he writing with his finger on the ground? Verse 8, and again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Now notice, guys, pay attention. He wrote on the ground with his finger. This has to do with the law of Moses. Deuteronomy 9, verse 10. Deuteronomy 9, verse 10. Let's see if you make the connection. Deuteronomy 9, verse 10. Law of Moses. Jesus writes with his finger on the ground. Deuteronomy 9, verse 10, Richard, here you go. And the Lord Jehovah delivered unto me, Moses speaking, two tables of stone, here's the law, written with the finger of God. And on them was written, according to all the words, which Jehovah spoke with you. God wrote the law of Moses with his finger. The same God is in the flesh, and he writes on the ground with his finger. Church family, Ecclesia, I know you want attention. Be patient. I don't want to block you, buddy. Exodus 31, 18. Exodus 31, 18. Exodus 31, 18. And he gave unto Moses when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone written with the finger of God. Jesus is God in the flesh. They're trying to confront him about a law in Moses. And he stoops down and writes on the ground with his finger as a way of sig signaling to you that I am the very God of Moses who gave him the law in the first place, written by my finger, and they're trying to use my law against me. And it's unfortunate you have critical scholars, New Testament textual critics, who want you to lose confidence in the authenticity of this passage. One of the most powerful witnesses to the deity of Jesus Christ. Exactly, Tony. Now, it also ties in with another passage, which my friend was too excited and wanted to show people. Look, I know it too. Look, me. I got me, me, me. Ooh. It also ties in with Jeremiah 17, 13. Jeremiah 17, 13. I love you, church family, Ecclesia. I'm going to give you our time because I love you. I know you're excited, friend. Don't be too excited. Now, Jeremiah 17, 13. This also connects him with Jehovah God who spoke to Jeremiah. Here you go. Pay attention. He wrote on the ground, O Jehovah the Lord, the hope of Israel, all that forsake thee shall be ashamed. So those who forsake you, like those Jews who wanted to accuse him, those Jews who wanted to turn against him, they want to forsake him. All forsake thee shall be ashamed, and they that depart from thee from, from me, like they did, they departed from him, shall be written in the earth, because they have forsaken Jehovah, the fountain of living waters. Wow. Group of Jews that turn their back against Jesus, that depart from him, right? God will make note of them, writing them on the earth, because they forsook Jesus, the fount of living waters. <whistles> but wait. Where does it say that Jesus is the font of living waters? John 7, 38 to 39. To tie in with Jeremiah 17, 13. John 7, 38 to 39. John 7, 38 to 39. There you go. 
He that believeth on me, Jesus says, he that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Here you go. Jesus, the source of living water. But this spake he of the spirit, which they that believe on him should receive for the Holy Ghost was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So Jesus is the source of living water. He's the one who gives you the Holy Spirit that satisfies your thirst forever. He's the one who wrote on the ground in the presence of his enemies who hated him and turned their back on him. And he wrote with his finger as an indication. He is the God of Moses that wrote the law for Moses with his finger, the very law they're trying to use against him. John 4, verse 10 and 13 and 14. John 4, verse 10 and 13 and 14. John chapter 4, verse 10 and verses 13 and 14. Bass, are you even following me? He's writing on the ground with his finger to show you I'm the one who wrote the law for Moses with my finger. Hello? It doesn't matter what he wrote. He's doing that to show you who he is. John 4, verse 10 and 13 and 14. Okay. Jesus answered, said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldst have asked him, you would have asked me, and he would have given thee living water. 13 and 14. 13 and 14. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. I will give him this water, and he'll never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up unto everlasting life. Now, with that said, let's read Jeremiah 17, 13 again. Jeremiah 17, verse 13 again. And let's end it. Let's go now step by step again. O Jehovah, the hope of Israel, all that forsake thee shall be ashamed, and they that depart from, from me shall be written in the earth because they have forsaken Jehovah the Lord, the fountain of living waters. That's one connection. Deuteronomy 9, 10, chapter 9, verse 10, and Exodus 31, verse 18. Deuteronomy 9, verse 10, and Exodus 31, verse 18. Well, it's also about himself because Father, Son, Holy Spirit, they are living waters. They quench your thirst and give you eternal life. Now, Deuteronomy 9, verse 10, and Exodus 31, verse 18. Let's read. And Jehovah, the Lord, delivered unto me two tables of stone, the law of Moses, which contains the command of adultery, with the finger of God, and on them was written according to all the words which Jehovah spake with me. Exodus 31, 18. And he gave unto Moses, when he had made end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone written with the finger of God, the law that contains the command of adultery. And they come to Jesus, accusing him or accusing a woman of adultery. And what does Jesus do? The law of Moses about adultery. Let's read it. John 8, verse 6 and verse 8. John 8, verse 6 and verse 8, and we're done. John 8, verse 6 and verse 8. And let's end. Jason, I'll share that right after this. I'll explain how. And this is where you praise the triune God because he's more real than we can imagine. He's our life. The triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. John 8, verse 6 and verse 8. Watch here. That this they said, tempting him that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground, there's the finger of Jehovah, as though he heard them not, verse 8. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. There you go. Jesus is that Jehovah God who wrote the law of Moses that included the command of adultery with his finger and gave it to Moses. 
He's that Jehovah God who writes on the ground the names of those who depart from him, forsaking him, who gives them living waters because he's a source of living water, Jeremiah 17, 13. Because Jesus is Jehovah God Almighty, one with the Father and the Spirit. And yet, if you read your modern versions, there's a note that makes you doubt and call into question the textual veracity of this passage. Isn't that pitiful? One of the most powerful witnesses to Jesus being God Almighty of the Old Testament, the God of Moses, the God of Jeremiah. And in John 12, he's said to be the God of Isaiah, whom Isaiah saw in Isaiah 6. And John 8, he's the God of Abraham, right? This very section, and yet you have modern versions. Don't, don't take my word for it. Open up a modern Bible. They have a note right before 753, causing you to doubt the textual veracity and inspiration of this section. Shame, isn't it? Now, to answer your question, someone says, how am I able to recall these passages? I didn't do anything. I didn't follow any memorization guide or do any memorization techniques. Early on, early on, I became aware of my ability to recall passages at the moment when I needed to. In other words, if I'm in a conversation or if I'm teaching, passages just come into my mind, and I realized that was the grace, the gift, the love of the triumph God, the Holy Spirit's enabling me to recall passages to be used for his glory to glorify Jesus Christ. So that's one of the gifts that God has given me. So now here's how you can bless me and repay me for my service. Pray the Holy Spirit will perfect these gifts in me, right? Pray the Holy Spirit will give me the power to be passionately, perfectly in love with him, with the Son and the Father. Pray the Holy Spirit empowers me to worship him, the Son and the Father, perfectly, to crucify my flesh and save me from my flesh. Pray he fights for my daughters and I and provides for me financially do this. Guys, if you feel that God has called me into ministry, then I need brothers to prayerfully consider partnering with me financially for the glory of Christ, to continue to do this till I die and to provide for my kids. And pray God will save me from my trials and Satan. And so with that said, I need you guys to be praying hard for me because September 26 is a big date. September 26 will determine whether I'm free in October to travel to a new state, start a new life, and trusting Jesus will bring my daughters to me, or whether my trial will be delayed and prolonged or I cannot leave in October. I need your prayers, guys, September 26. So pray for traveling mercies. Pray God shows up. I want to be free to serve the Lord, to have freedom and not worry about corrupt judges and a corrupt judicial system, to serve the Lord, to start a new life, to grow in holiness and righteousness and purity, to love Jesus more and love you more, trusting he'll bring my angels from my miss and pray for my daughters, my nine, my nine-year-old and my six-year-old, how I miss them and ache for them and I love them. Okay. So Lord willing, I don't know when I'll be back because I have to travel back to LA tomorrow, God willing. I fly out Tuesday morning, God willing, and then Thursday is that big date, and I need to be delivered. But look for me on social media, on my Facebook pages, and I'll try to teach another session during the week. But I need your prayers, your support, your love, especially for my children. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Jehovah God Almighty in the flesh. The God of Moses, the God of Jeremiah, the God of Isaiah, the God of all creation. One with the Father and the Spirit, and we love you, Lord Jesus. Save us, wash us in your blood, wash my daughters in your blood, fill us with the Spirit, and be with us, Lord, and save us from the enemy. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you guys. See you soon, Lord willing. Hit the like button, subscribe, pass this on to others, listen to it again, and be blessed for the glory of Christ.